we would not fear man, but that we would fear you and that we would earnestly and graciously speak words of life uh, to our family. Uh, Father, we do pray for all our, all our students who are going to be taking a break from school, uh, both college, high school, and uh, under. We pray, God, that you would just give them rest and refreshment. We pray, God, that they would give themselves not only to, to rest and relaxation, but they would give themselves to study and, and learning about you. God, that they would uh, take advantage of the time that they have uh, in your word. Father, we thank you so much that the gospel goes forth throughout our world. Uh, Father, we pray for the gospel to go forth in China. Father, as that nation continues to try to crack down upon Christians, we pray that your kindness would, 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 be, would be evident to the people there. Those who are persevering under persecution, we pray, God, that you would allow them to be effective in their communication of the gospel. Uh, Father, we pray for the IMB missionaries who are on the ground, God, working with pastors and, and ch or churches. We pray, God, that you'd be gracious and kind to them. Bring your gospel favor uh, to them. Father, we also just pray for our, our nation. God, we pray specifically today for those who place an authority in terms of our uh, police chiefs and fire, fire uh, chiefs who are across our land. God, we pray as they have, have been given the responsibility to help shepherd and care for the safety of our nation. God, we pray you'd give them wisdom, Father, that, that we would, would be thankful for their service. God, that we would support and pray uh, for them as they protect us in our, for our freedoms. Father, we also just thank you so much that the gospel goes forth in our community. Father, we pray for Chad Merrill at uh, North Rock Hill today. We pray, God, as, as, you would, uh, as Chad preaches today, that you would fill him up with your spirit. Father, that he would be a blessing to his people. Uh, Father, we also pray for Remedy Church and, and Northside Church, our, our, our sister congregations. God, we pray that you would be a blessing to them as both uh, Fudd and, uh, and Pastor Scott preach. We pray that they would be uh, filled with your spirit that help edify and strengthen that congregation. Lord, and as we look towards the day when we'll be gathered on Tuesday, Father, we pray that we would all come with joyful hearts ready to hear your word and worship together. And Father, now as we come to this sacred hour where the people of God at Park Baptist Church hear your word, God, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. That as I exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the preaching of your word, I pray that you would uh, speak through me by the power of your Holy Spirit. You would take this word and you would plant it on the hearts of your people, that they would reap a harvest, 30 to 60 to 100 what is sown. Father, we know that um, unless you speak, we can do nothing. God, unless the, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Father, I do not want to labor in vain this morning. We do not want to labor in vain as your people. We want you to speak to us, God. We want you to, to build us up in Christ. We want you to, to shape and to fashion us in your likeness. We pray that you would reveal in us where we are ungrateful for the things that you have given us. We, we pray that you would reveal to us where we are, are lacking in our, using our gifts to serve you. Uh, God, we pray that you would expose any sin in us and that you would remind us of the hope of the gospel. God, I pray again today that you would teach us, refine us, and show us where true atonement lies. And it only lies in you. So, Father, we pray that you would take this word, strengthen, edify your people. We ask this not only for our good, but for your glory's sake. And we ask this in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as you see, God has blessed us with a tremendous amount of college students. Uh, praise God for that. Uh, one of the joys I've had over these last uh, several years is uh, to take, see these college students be, being single and then start dating and then start moving towards, towards marriage. Uh, so I've done a lot of uh, premarital counseling as they kind of enter into this setting a foundation for their, for their upcoming marriage. And one of the questions I usually always ask is, uh, what did you see in your parents' marriage that was beneficial? things that you want to take with you into, into your marriage. And they give me some positive examples that they've seen from watching their, their parents. And then I turn and I say, well, what are some negative examples that you learn from watching your parents that you don't want to emulate in, in your marriage? Uh, whether they, they, how often they fought or how they never talked about money, whatever the case may be. Because we can learn both by positive examples and by negative examples. Right? We, we know that, that that's true in, in all life. And I think when we look through the, the Old Testament, what we see is we see a lot of negative examples. And we're going to be able to look at that today as we look at the people of Israel, how they were unthankful, right? This is the anti-Thanksgiving message, rousing fun for the whole family, right? This is the, we look at this example of how the Israelites were unthankful and how we would not want to follow their example, that we would do the opposite uh, for them. I know that many of you, when you uh, got your bulletins today and you opened it up and you saw nine points, there was a, something in you that said, I am so thankful 
that today I don't just have three points. Today, as we look towards Thanksgiving, I get to rejoice in nine points. If you didn't have that reaction, I hope that you feel convicted already, <laughs> right? Um, but Lord willing, we will, I, I am the one who's separating you from eating, so Lord willing, we'll be moving through this quickly and getting to our time of, of, of celebration. Well, I do think this is important for us to learn from the Israelites how they didn't worship the Lord and how they struggled with thanking God for all that he was doing in their lives. Uh, so the first point I want you to see is the impatience in delay. Impatience in delay. Look back with me in Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. A beloved, impatience is one of the greatest indicators of your ungratefulness. Impatience for when things are delayed in your life is an indicator of your ungratefulness for what God has given you. I mean, just think about how often we are tempted with our impatience. Uh, when we are, are in, in traffic, things are, are not moving fast enough. On the way here to church, I was coming down Oakland Avenue and there was one light that just never changes. And you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. It was, I think there was like three different cycles of cars and I, I never moved because my light never changed. And um, I was talking to my son who was, who was next to me, and, um, and there was some, some impatience running up in my heart. And I told him, I said, son, I'm, I'm preaching on impatience today. He goes, he just started laughing. He said, that's funny. Um, well, we know that restaurant services is slow. We, we tend to struggle with impatience. We want to demand our food. We're working on a, maybe you see projects around the house that your spouse has, has not gotten to, and you see this impatience rising within you. Now, we, we know that we struggle with impatience when things don't move as fast as we would like, but the, the, those are simple things. I think that the, the greater challenges, the things that affect our, our heart and our mind, are those big things in our life that we desperately want but have not yet received. We, we want a spouse. We're single and we want a spouse, and yet God has not given us one. We want a child. We're desperate for a child, and the Lord has not seen fit to fill the womb. Uh, there may be a a position or a job that you want, that you're just waiting and buying time, and yet it does not come. Beloved, impatience reveals our lack of gratefulness for what God has done, and it forces us to focus on what we have not yet received. This really was, is, the, is the trick of the evil one. You know, God has promised to do many things for us, and we want it in our timing, and when things don't happen in our timing, we get discouraged. Well, the people of Israel had, had been spoiled, now, we know for 400 years they were waiting to be freed from Egypt. But over these last several years, we don't know the, the full amount of time, maybe even a, a few months, what did they see? They see that they, God delivered them from Egypt through all these plagues. Week after week, they saw God answer and deliver them through the plagues. They, they, God, they, these, the people of Israel saw them part the Red Sea and, and walk across on dry land, and then their enemies chase after them, and the waters fall upon them. More deliverance. The people of Israel saw God rain food down from heaven. Uh, they, they saw God give water from a rock. They saw God move and move and move. And even here, God just gave them the wonderful Ten Commandments, and they just had this covenant service that, yes, we will do all that you tell us to do. And now we see they are impatient. They were spoiled for God's activity in their life. And when God didn't move as fast as they want, they grew impatient. And I just wonder how spoiled are we? We live in a ready-made society. Things happen really quickly. And things don't happen the way we want in our timing. And we tend to have this bitterness directed towards the Lord. If you read uh, the Old Testament, you'll find that one of the, the, the common phrases is wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Maybe this afternoon, read Psalm 37 and just see how God says, do not fret, but wait for me. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. I think when we study how God's saints were waiting for him, we would maybe grow in our own patience before the Lord. Secondly, we see, which is connected, we have faithless in uncertainty. Faithless in 
uncertainty. The, the, the challenge of delay and timing is that what it causes in our hearts, it causes us to not believe in God. It causes us to question His character, question His goodness, question His, his plan, His wisdom. You know, in, in, in our world, there are many of us here who struggle with anxiety. And when the Lord Jesus was, was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, do not be anxious about the future, what you will eat, what you will wear, what you will, you will drink. Don't worry about tomorrow, but tomorrow worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness today. Trust him today, and I'll take care of all that. And yet, how hard is that? How hard is it to, to look out in the future and, and not know what's going to happen maybe in a week from now or two weeks from now? The, the, your, your company was just bought out. Am I going to have a job a month from now? Am I going to be able to afford Christmas, right? Are we going to be able to afford having a, a baby? I'm pregnant. What do, what do we do? All these uncertain things in the future cause us to, to question God. Uncertainty can certainly produce anxiety, but it also can do, produce faith. When you don't know what will happen, you can put your faith and trust in God and his character and his, in his goodness. So let me just ask you, where are you tempted today to doubt God's goodness? What thing in your life are you tempted to question him because he has delayed in providing it for you? I just encourage you that God has a plan. What's going on in your life right now is not a surprise to God. He knows exactly where you are, he knows exactly what you need, and he knows exactly what you need when you need it. God is in charge. And this is the temptation when, when we don't know what, what's coming and we don't know, don't see the things we happen in, in our life, what do we do? We can do one of two things. We can trust God or we can doubt him. We can trust him or we can doubt him. I mean, think about the disciples. The disciples walk with Jesus. They knew him intimately, and yet the storm is raging, and they go to Jesus and say, Jesus, wake up. Do you not care that we're about to die? And Jesus woke up and said, what? To the storm, peace, be still. And instantly the storm stopped. And he looked at them and said, have you no faith? Listen, beloved, have faith. Things may not be where you want them in your life. And you may be tempted to, to be bitter against the Lord, to be angry at the Lord, or just to withdraw your relationship from the Lord. But listen, God knows where you are. He knows what you need. And he wants to provide himself to you. The Israelites didn't like this uncertainty. They didn't like a God they could not see, so they said, will you make us a God? Make us a God that we can see because we don't know what's happening. This is often what we do. We, we don't know the things that are happening in the future, so we would try to take control of the future and, and make, make it a, a reality. We want a God we can see, but the Bible's very clear. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. The righteous shall live by faith walking into uncertainty with faith. The third thing we see this, of the Israelites where they lacked their forgive, or thanksgiving was a mistrust of authority, a mistrust of authority. Look back at Exodus 32.1. It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods, who shall go before us, make gods we can see. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, this is not exactly true because they know what's become of him. He's up on the mountain <laughs> talking to God. They knew exactly where he, he was. But their lack of faith in their present circumstances didn't always turn directly towards God. It turned towards God's leaders. This is typical in, in, in the life of God's people. God's people struggle with authority. Why do we struggle with authority? Why do we struggle, struggle uh, honoring authorities? Because we have the, the sin of, of, of Adam in us. 
who didn't trust God's authority and his good word. He, he, he followed the, the, the serpent in. So we are naturally in the flesh going to question and challenge authority. Well, if you just have your Bibles with me, take, hold your, your, your place here and turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. This is a great picture of um, Stephen's sermon. Stephen was being questioned. He was being questioned on not believing in Moses. He didn't believe, he said he was speaking against Moses and he was kind of challenging the, the Pharisees, the Jews of his day. Uh, we're going to pick up the, the sermon right there in the middle in uh, Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. He's talking directly about this passage that we read in Exodus. So Stephen says, in inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, this, is, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us down from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the work of their hands." But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of God, Raphon, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. If you see here, the, the, what, what Stephen is saying is the people of Israel didn't just turn their anger towards Moses, they turned their hearts toward Egypt. They saw all that God did for them, all the mighty work of his hand. And remember, all throughout that, the Exodus narrative, what, is, what, is, what are these plagues meant to symbolize? That you will know that I am the Lord. That you will know that I am the Lord. And as soon as Moses, their leader, is not there, where do their hearts turn? Back towards Egypt. Egypt. I would just say this. It is a worldly, a satanic, and a pagan attitude to naturally distrust godly leaders. Moses was a godly leader. Now, we can make a lot of caveats of how leaders in our day are not godly and are not righteous, those you should not follow. There's sometimes a it's good to challenge our, our leaders. But they did not trust Moses, God's leader who he put over them. In essence, they didn't trust God. They weren't trusting God and the one that God placed over them. The response to our leaders sometimes reveal an ungratefulness for God's plan and for God's leaders. And it often has more to do with us than it does our, our leaders. And we see this throughout the happening of God's people. Things are not happening as fast as we would like, and we tend to turn on God's people. You can just watch the, the news today and see how fast the people of God turn on people. They praise their name one minute, and they turn on them the next. That is not the way God's people should be. And I can say as a pastor, I am so grateful for how you honor me as your pastor I probably a week does not go by, even a day probably does not go by that I don't get a message from, from one of you here in this church that says, I'm praying for you, Pastor. I'm praying for you each and every night that God would protect you, that God would, would give you wisdom and grace and strength to continue to lead us well. Praise God for that. I mean, continue to do that. Praise his name. You know, that's, that's what we see throughout the Bible. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, that pastors and teachers are gifts to the church, to, to lay their lives down, to build you up so you can become more like Christ. Hebrews 13, seven, remember your leaders and their way of life. Imitate them. Follow their example. First Thessalonians chapter, chapter five, honor those who are over you in the Lord. Esteem their work highly in love for their work for you. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders, submit to them. They give an account for your souls. 
And I just say that this is not like one of those self-gratifying messages, can sound like that. Honor and respect your pastor, don't, trust, don't distrust their authority. What I'm saying in this is that God is the one who's the ultimate authority, and he has created authority structures in our life. And the problem with Israel, they did not trust God's authority structure. You see how they did that? They, they, they called this Moses. They kind of, kind of, you know, as they say these days, they threw, threw, threw shade at Moses, right? Right? This Moses, who's this guy? You know, we, we, well, Moses is the one who, who rescued you from slavery by the Lord's hand. It wasn't Moses who did any of this. It was the Lord who did. So I, I'm incredibly encouraged uh, for the love that we have from this congregation. You know, not only myself, but the other elders would, would have testified to the same thing. God has used you tremendously in recent days to encourage my heart. But beloved, we're not perfect. We're going to be making mistakes. We may be leading you in ways that sometimes may not be the best or that you may not feel is the best. You know, we're praying, we're, we're seeking God's guidance. You know, so as, as we move forward as a congregation, I, I pray that you would continue to pray, that your default would be to trust, not to challenge, to pray for rather than criticize. Now, if you know if there's things in our lives and in our, in our leading as, as a congregation that you need to address, beloved, pray Pray, 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 and then encourage, 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 and then come to us with your concern. And I could t- do, this is a, a very clear thing from our elders. We want to be men who hear and listen when rebuke comes. We don't want to gloss over that because that is the essence of godly leadership. Because when you are leading, not as the Gentiles do, lording it over you, but as a humble servant, like the, the Lord Jesus as an under shepherd who came and laid down his life for us. But the people of Israel did not respect Moses, who was going for them before the Lord. The next thing that we see here is how Aaron, also acting as authority, did not trust God's word, but fashioned an image, fashioning our image. And if you think about it, this is one of the ways that we struggle in the American church is that we tend to make God in our own image rather than making God and uh, worshiping the God as he revealed himself in the Bible. Look with me, verses two through four. God's word says, so Aaron said to them, take off the rings of the gold that are on your ears of your wives, your, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took their, off the rings of the gold and were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods of Israel. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Notice those, the people who responded by saying that. Aaron didn't say that. Aaron said the very next thing, verse five, when Aaron saw that he saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be the feast to the Lord. So Aaron knew the people's hearts were, 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 were evil and not doing what is right, and he tried to twist it and try to do it in a, the best possible light. But, but I think that the key word here is, is fashioned. If you want it with me, just jump down to verse 21 of Exodus 32 and just listen how um, Aaron responds to Moses when, when he was questioned. So in verse 21, it says, and Moses said to Aaron, what did this do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them. So Moses leaves, Aaron's in charge. Aaron, what happened that made you want to make a golden calf? After you just heard, you shall have no other gods before you. Do not make for yourself a graven image. What happened? And listen to what Aaron says. Verse 22, Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought you us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any of you who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's what happened. Thanks, Aaron. But what, what, what Aaron did, Aaron fashioned it. This was a very specific process, right? Where you have a piece of wood overlaid with gold, shaped and fashioned. It would have taken time. It was a complex process. 
One way we express our ingratitude for what God has given to us is using our gifts for ourselves or for evil purposes. This is exactly what happened here. All the earrings in their ear were gifts by God's hand when they left Egypt. Take this resources to start a new life. We mentioned this briefly last week. Those slaves were, were given resources to start a new life. And they took the gifts that God gave them and they used what? They used them to serve evil. And said so the people are set on evil. We might as well allow it, Aaron said. There's no way that I should, I, I could push back on this. Why, why fight it? Why don't I just let the, the people do what the people want? Let me just ask you, how are you using the gifts God's given you to serve others? Are you using the, the talents that God has given you for the upbuilding of his, of his name to encourage godliness or to promote evil? When we don't use our gifts for God and for his glory, we are being ungrateful to God. Hear me. If God has given you gifts to serve and build up others and you are not using them for that purpose, I think that you are being ungrateful to God. In a membership interview this week, uh, Witt and I were, were talking to um, someone joining the church and we were talking about all the blessings that the church can offer this person and how God has given us these, these gifts of the church to help strengthen and encourage them. And um, which is kind of asked, and said, remember that it's not only about what this church can, can bring to you, it's what you can bring to this church. That, that God has gifted you in a specific way to use your gifts to build up the body of, of Christ. This is one of the things that God wants for his people. There's some of you here, right, who are considering joining our congregation and haven't crossed the line yet. I would encourage you to cross the line. Because God wants you to use your gifts for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And I think if we're not fully using those gifts, other people can't enjoy them. So if, when I tell people, and I, I believe this wholeheartedly, that when you join Park Baptist Church, if God is leading you to join this church, you know what God is telling me? That this church is deficient without this person. You need their gifts to become a better reflection of Christ. Because God distributes good gifts to his church. He wants you to be part of a body so you can use your strength and your gifts to build up the body of Christ. I pray that all of us would take great care in our gifts and our talents to be a blessing to God. Number five, we see an unthankful people are living in pleasure. Living in pleasure. Look at verse six. The people of Israel rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The language in the, in the Greek there, or, is, or in the Hebrew, is, is really specific about um, kind of raucous, uh, sensual play. So remember, God's people were called to be a holy people. He who called us is holy, therefore we should be holy in all that we, we do. Uh, but the people of Israel wanted a God that they could see because they wanted a God they could control so that they could serve and meet their own desires. And their own desires were, were that of pleasure. They offered the burnt offerings, they offered the sacrifices, but then they rose up to do what? To live in debauchery. This is the, the longing of going back to Egypt. This is how the Egyptians used to, to worship. Their worship was, was mixed with a lot of with drinking and sensuality and, and sexual orgies. This is what happened in, in Egypt. And the people of Israel, after they heard from God himself, about how he was going to visit iniquity upon the sins of the people. We're longing to go back like that. I wonder how much of the church today is playing with God. They want to make him in their own image so that they can do what they, they want. They wanted to see more and more. While the people wanted the golden calf, they wanted a party. They wanted pleasure. I pray if that's you this morning, if you are living in sin, living for your own pleasure, I pray that you would repent today. That is an ungrateful way to live before the Lord. Number six, we see God's anger at this ingratitude. God's anger at this ingratitude. Verse seven through 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you just brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. 
and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Let me just make a couple observations in terms of how the Lord responded to the people of Israel. Uh, one, he changed from calling them my people to calling them your people. The Lord was showing there was a separation from the people of Israel to God because of their, their sin. As the, as the text goes on, he says, I have seen this people. I think that's God taking a shot at them saying, I have seen this Moses. One of the things that you see throughout the Bible is that if you treat God a certain way, he'll often treat you in kind. Not a, he, call, he calls the people here a stiff-necked people. Uh, this is a, a way that we often refer to Israel. This is the first time it's used in, in the Bible referring to the people of Israel. Um, this is kind of the, the picture of an ox that refuses to have the yoke put on them. It's a people who refuse to submit a stubborn and disobedient people. Let me just say this. If you're one of those people who say, I'm just stubborn, that's not a good thing. Our stubbornness is a sign of our inflexibility to love others. Our stubbornness often is a sign of us not willing to submit to God and his word. The Bible says if you're stubborn, you're stiff-necked, it's not a good description. That one was for free, okay? And then God says to this, he says, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And you can imagine the, the, the shame and, and the grief that God felt here. After all that he did, we, we, we see that you know, God is angry, but his anger is expressed differently than the way we, we experience emotions. But sometimes God accommodates to us. He, he, he speaks in human terms so we can understand things. I mean, we're coming towards Thanksgiving. Imagine many of, of, of the ladies in the room, some of you men, but many of you ladies are going to be laboring in the kitchen. Uh, you're going to be cooking all this wonderful food. And uh, can you imagine after hours of preparation, you sat down at the dinner table and, and, and someone goes, this turkey's dry. You don't have enough rolls. Well, we had to get the canned cranberries. I mean, after laboring all day long, what's going to happen? To, you're going to be hurt and shameful, and you're going to say, just leave me alone. I have done so much for you, and this is how you repay me. So just think about the, the emotion of the Lord here. <laughs> I've rescued you from slavery. I sent all these plagues. I parted the Red Sea for you. I, I gave you bread in the middle of the, the desert. I struck a rock to give you food, to give you water. I've conquered your enemies. I'm done with you. But there's a reason why God is doing this. He's doing this not only so that he could show his, 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 the emotional state of what happens when, when sin enters the picture, but I think this is also an invitation to Moses. He's, he's hoping that Moses will, will respond and encourage and teach all of us how God brings redemption from sin. God brings redemption from sin through a mediator. This is exactly what, what happens. Notice right there at the end of chapter 10, or verse 10 rather, it says that um, I will consume them in order to make a great nation out of you. Do you hear what Moses, God is saying? Moses, if you want, they're gone. I'll consume all of them and I'll start over with you. And listen to what Moses' reply is, which is our, our seventh point, pleading for the stubborn, pleading for the stubborn. Verse 11, God's word. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent that he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from the burning anger and turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven. All this, the land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, that you shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he spoke, had spoken of bringing on his people. A few things that we see here. I got this from. Uh, one of the commentaries I read this past week, the, the, the appeal that God, uh, that Moses does to God, there's, I think, five that we see here. Uh, number one, we see an appeal for fatherly affection. Moses turns it around and says, these are not 
These are not the Moses' people. These are your people. You see what it says there in verse, um, verse 11? Why does your wrath burn against your people? Moses is appealing to the fatherly love that God has for his people. Secondly, he, he talks about how he's rescued them, right? You brought them out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. You have invested a lot in these people, Lord. Finish your work. There's an appeal to the father's reputation. Moses is crying, Lord, you don't want the, 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 your name to be defamed among, among the, the world, among Egyptians. They, they only brought him out to kill them. He was cared about God's reputation. He was an appeal for, for God's, God's mercy. Now, beloved, God had every right to burn in anger against his people. These people deserve wrath, but Moses appealed for mercy. And then lastly, he, he appealed to God's own word, God's promise. Remember, God, your word, what you promised to your people, that you, you will cause them to be like the sand of the seashore, like the stars in the heaven. And we see here Moses is acting like a priest. He's going before the Lord, pleading for the people of God, a forerunner to the, the great high priest, the Lord Jesus. And it says in verse 14 that God relented of his disaster. Instead of wiping all of them out, things are going to be different. And yet, number eight, we still see the consequences of sin. The consequences of sin. Look at verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain and the, with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, tablets that were written in both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people and as they shouted, the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of the hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to the powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do that you have done, brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know peop the people that they were set on evil. Jump down to verse 25. And Moses saw that the people had broken loose for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is the Lord on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate to, to gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. So as Moses came down, we see a couple things. We see that the commandments were literally and symbolically broken. The Ten Commandments were broken. They were worshiping a false god. Moses then takes the calf, he burns it to ash, and then does what? He sprinkles it in the water, then he makes the people of God drink it. To show really what happens to our idols. Beloved, the things that we cherish, the things that we nourish, God says will become refuse. You'll eat it up and it'll go out. It is not worth living for. Emphatically showing that an idol, this idol is not God. But we see ultimately what sin brings, it brings death. And we know this from the, from the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. And we see that right here. And now we know that God did not wipe out the entire people of Israel, but he still brought death. The Levites were given the difficult task of carrying out judgment against sin. And what do we see? 3,000 were slain that day. Sin is very serious. Never think 
that when you are rejoicing in sin and living it up as the people of Israel did, that there will not be consequences. There will always be consequences of sin. And these are the, the, the physical ones that we see. We're not even talking about the shame and the guilt and the regret that you feel in your heart. Oh, friends, please hear me. Stop sinning. Stop coddling and massaging that secret sin. Confess it and run from it as far and as fast as you can. And lastly, number nine, be grateful that there's an atonement. Be grateful for the atonement. This is an interesting passage. Look at verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned against, sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. That's, that's, the, the, that's the beginning of coming back to the Lord, is admitting our sin. If you're here today and you are a non-Christian, just, just know this, that we all think we're sinners. We all think that we have committed great sins. None of us are trying to, to show that we're not. The beginning of salvation in Christ and, and turning from death to life is the beginning of acknowledging that you're a sinner, that you have committed great sin against God. Moses acknowledged that before the Lord. Now this is what his plea is. He says, they have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. So he says, Lord, please forgive them. And if you can't forgive them, take my life. He's probably thinking both physically here, take my physical life, but possibly also his this eternal life, the, the book of life that we know is mentioned in Revelation. Now, listen to what the Lord says. Because we think about this, Moses is going before the Lord as a mediator, pleading for intercession, pleading for the sins of the people. Forgive them. And God doesn't. Look what the text says. What the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they, have made, because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. Moses came down for came to the Lord and was turned down. God did not accept his sacrifice because sin needed to be punished. God's wrath needed to be satisfied. And Moses was not perfect, so therefore he could not make perfect atonement. So what this passage is, is leading you to, it's leading you to how can there be atonement? Because Moses said, as we read in Acts 7, he prophesied there's going to come another who's going to be raised up from among your brothers. And he, and he alone, is able to bring you atonement. The Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. We are left here to think, how can have our names in the book? How can our name be written in the Lamb's book of life that we would not be blotted out? The only way that we will not be blotted out from the book is that if we are not a sinner in the eyes of God, but a redeemed saint. This is what happens when, when we come to Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the, the perfect sacrifice, died in our place, fully taking on God's wrath, fully satisfying everything that we have done wrong. He took it upon himself, was dead and buried, was raised from the dead, and said, if you believe in me, I will clothe you. I will wrap you in the righteous robes of Christ, washed in the blood of the Lamb. So now when God sees you, he no longer sees you as a sinner. He sees you as a saint, redeemed and holy in God's sight. That's the hope of the gospel. Moses was not the Savior. He was just pointing us to the one that was to come. I find it interesting with these numbers. Moses was up on the mountain meeting with God, and 3,000 people died. 
when our Savior died and rose again, he ascended into heaven and he told his saints, wait for me. And his people did. And when the Holy Spirit came, 3,000 souls did not die, but were added to the church that day. Beloved, the reason why we can have hope today is because our Savior died, rose again, ascended to the right hand of God, and sends his Holy Spirit. So we as God's people can always be grateful for atonement. We have been forgiven today and every day of our lives, and one day we will stand before him as his people, knowing how great how great it is to have full atonement in Christ. So I pray for this Thanksgiving season. You would not have the Thanksgiving of the Israelites, this anti-Thanksgiving, and not appreciating all that God's done for me, done for you. I pray that you would run to the cross, you would strive for holiness, serve the body, and that you would rejoice in the cross, and this Thanksgiving you would share that cross, the message of hope in the gospel, with all you come across. That's what we are truly thankful for this Thanksgiving season, is that we have an atonement, a perfect atonement in Christ. Father, we pray that you would be glorified today in our lives. We pray that we would live for your glory and your glory alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.